I want to uh, use my remarks tonight to explain why I think the Labour Party's historic opposition to the project of European integration is actually consistent with the vision of global Britain, uh, whereby the UK is a champion of international cooperation, anti-racism, and democratic economic control against the forces of capital. I think it's important to say, first off, that Euroscepticism was the mainstream position of the British Labour Party for four decades. Post-war leaders were Eurosceptic, senior cabinet ministers were Eurosceptic, trade union leaders were Eurosceptic, the majority of the party's MPs were Eurosceptic and its membership. And there are three main objections to European Union membership that go to the heart of the Labour Party as a democratic, socialist and internationalist party. The first and perhaps most familiar objection against the EU from the British left is on socialist grounds. From the earliest days of the proposal for European unity, British socialists and Labour politicians have expressed deep concern over a project aimed at imposing free market economics within Europe while erecting trade and other protectionist barriers to much of the rest of the world. For example, in reaction to the Schumann plan for Europe, the European coal and steel community, flatly rejected by the Labour Prime Minister Clem Attlee and the Foreign Secretary Ernie Bennett, the Labour Party's international officer Dennis Healy wrote, No socialist party, with the prospect of forming a majority government, could accept a system by which important fields of national policy were surrendered to a supranational European representative authority. Socialists have identified that the European Union is set up according to liberal economic model. This model prioritizes the rights of business and capital over socialist programs. The EU principle of freedom of establishment, for example, means that national governments cannot place what are perceived as overly onerous criteria on companies which might seek to operate in another EU member state. The ECJ can and has, using that freedom, declared that regulations requiring certain labour standards make it too difficult, too onerous for another EU firm to operate in a country. So that country is required to abandon its trade union legislation or fall afoul of the EU treaties. This applies even outside of the EU. The countries in the single market, such as Norway, which has seen its labour laws protecting dockers struck down by the ECJ. For the Labour Party, this dynamic raises special concerns given the party's history. One of the reasons why an independent Labour Party came about to begin with, separate from the Liberal Party, was to overturn through legislation anti trade union rulings which came from British courts at the start of the 20th century, the tax bail judgment being the most famous. But while in Britain, anti-trade union rulings in British courts can be overturned by a simple majority in Parliament, decisions by the ECJ found to be grounded on the rights of the treaties cannot be overturned except through treaty change. In other words, if Norway wants its trade union laws back, every other member of every member of the European Union has to agree to it. Anara Inven, the founder of the NHS, and I from Eurosceptic, recognised this danger. Writing in reaction to the Treaty of Rome, Bevin excoriated the idea of a European common market. My Bevin said, the conception of a common market for Europe is not a blueprint for European prosperity and stability. It is the result of a political malaise following the failure of socialists to use the sovereign power of their parliaments to plan their economic life. The common market is an escapist conception, Bevin continued in which the play of the market forces will take the place of political responsibility. And incidentally, this is the theme that Jeremy Corbyn repeatedly raised in his writings on the European Union before he became Labour leader. The second concern is the constitutional democratic one. For many years, Labour Party critics of the European Union have highlighted the problems of removing important fields of national policy from national democratic institutions where voters expect these policies to be debated and decided, and instead transferring them up to institutions which are remote and which 
probably voters have very little organic connection. Now, in a properly democratic Europe, citizens wouldn't look to their national parliaments for the answers to their policy concerns. They would look to the European institutions. They would look and think about what's the Commission up to? What are my MEPs up to? And this is what Hugh Gatesall recognised in his famous 1000 Year History speech. He said, now, the real thing is, if you're going to have a democratic Europe, if you're going to control the running of Europe democratically, then you have to move to some form of federalism. And if anyone says anything differently, they are misleading the public. Joining a federal Europe will mean the end of independence. We must be clear about this. It does mean the end of Britain as an independent state. It means the end of a thousand years of history. Now you may say, let it end. But my goodness, it requires a bit of care and thought. Years later, another Labour leader, Jim Callaghan, argued that there was no appetite for this federal project. He said, it will be no use British electors under a federal Europe going to convey to candidates for Westminster Parliament to complain about prices or unemployment. Those parliamentary candidates will say to them that they have no power over these matters. Then the present Hampshire County Council does. Take it up with the European Parliament, they will say, and the best of British luck, because our representatives are in a permanent minority there. Now, Callaghan's words might sound extreme, even farcical, yet there has been a major area of national policy where this dynamic has been precisely in place, and that is immigration. And it goes to the heart of the third objection to the EU from a Labour perspective. And that is the EU as a barrier to true internationalism. Now, as a scholar of race and democracy in the United States, I've been fascinated by the intersection of racial divisions in countries and their immigration policy. And when Donald Trump spoke disparagingly of immigrants from Haiti and Mexico, I won't use the language here, uh, appropriate, um, and expressed his preference for immigrants from Norway, Trump was echoing decades-long racist immigration policy which had existed in the United States for most of the 20th century. In 1924, Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1924, the law which is now notorious in America, implemented an immigration regime which brought higher quotas on admissions from Europe over from the rest of the world. This European preference or European key jump was viewed as racist by anti-racist campaigners in the United States. And it was repealed during the civil rights movement in the 1960s when President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, signed the Immigration Act of 1965, which abolished the European preference. In my view, the UK and all members of the EU are effectively, if unwittingly, complicit in a racist immigration scheme, which provides a similar cue jump to mainly white Europeans over people from the rest of the world. Unless a country in the EU adopts a totally open immigration, open borders policy, then EU membership does necessarily entail treating mostly white Europeans more favourably than immigration from the rest of the world. And this is one of the reasons why white supremacists like Oswald Mosley were so keen on the European project, and why Mosley campaigned to remain in 1975. During that referendum, Oxfam and Christian Aid jointly published a pamphlet called The White Tribes of Europe. And prominent anti-racist MPs such as Barbara Castle, the founder of the British Anti-Apartheid Association, Julian Hart, who was the overseas development secretary, and Bernie Grant, who became a pioneering black British MP, were so strongly opposed to the project of European integration. Unfortunately, EU institutions continue to be populated by the white tribes. The record of racial minority representation in the EU is extremely poor. Out of 751 MPs, MEPs, just 17 are non-white, and half of those are British. To put that in perspective, the UK House of Commons, which is smaller, has 650 members, has 52 non-white MPs. Now, I don't wish to imply that a vote to remain was a racist vote. I know that people did vote to remain out of racist reasons. People generally weighed up other arguments. But I do think it's important for us to realize that a vote for remain was complicit with the long-standing tradition of white-oriented European privilege. And I think Barbara Castle's words 
in the 1975 Oxford Union speech are right when she said the largest and poorest countries are left out of this circle of privilege because their membership will not suit the interests of the European bloc. This is not the language of internationalism. This is your own jingoism. I wanted to conclude with the words of the late Prime Minister Kevin Attlee, who in 1960, in the 1960 gave a speech against Britain joining the common market. He said the idea of integrating Europe is historically looking backward, not forward. We have always looked outward, out to the new world, and today we look to the new world, Asia, and Africa. I think that integration of Europe is a step backward. By all means, let's have the best possible agreement between the various continents. But I'm afraid if we join the European Common Market, we are not joining an outward looking organisation, we are joining an inward looking organisation. I think that Germany probably will have the most powerful influence in this organisation. And it will not escape from what she thought she was going to gain and what she had lost. And I do not think we have a new look there. I think that by marrying into Europe, we are marrying into a whole family of ancient prejudices and ancient troubles. And so I want to conclude with that spirit of that. But I think that they should move forward with Brexit. And I think that we should get out of the protection to you and into the world. Finally, some dissent. Good. Very good. Uh, I said at the start.